today's session, we're going to be talking about hours of service. So whether you have ELD systems or whether you're actually using logbooks every once in a while or timesheets, we're going to be talking about um, the 150 error mile radius, the 100 error mile radius, driver salespeople, um, exceptions, exemptions. But what we're going to be doing is actually going through examples and doing you know, the logbook, filling it out, and I'm going to show you exactly what it is for the 11 hours, um, the 14 hour, the 70 hour, 60 hour. All right, so let's just get started. In here, I have an example of, this is from JJ Keller. They have logbooks that they sell. So um, now, whenever they change the ELD rule or whenever they put the ELD rule in place, typically you're not gonna see logbooks anymore, but you still have to have paper logbooks um, in the truck. So you're gonna have to have, I would say at least 30 days to so have one logbook in each truck because you have to have them if the ELD fails. So that is a requirement to be in the truck at all times is blank logs. I prefer honestly to have loose leaf um, logs whenever, especially for the ELD system, the, the mandate for that, for the having it being in the cab books because you don't want to use a whole log book for somebody who only needs it for that one day. So I prefer the loose leaf that way you can you know, take them out and then add more whenever you need to add more without having to basically take the whole log book and rip out pages because then it just looks sloppy. So um, prefer the loose leaf. But either way, JJ Keller sells them, other companies sell them. Um, so I'm just using an example on JJ Keller's log book for these purposes. So under 395.8, that's the record duty of status. And I'm going to read it to you and then I'm going to explain kind of how to, I guess, how to approach this. So uh, 395.8A1, drivers must record duty status and duplicate for each 24-hour period. The duty status shall be, t um, shall be recorded on a specified grid. They did not change this rule. And a lot of people say, well, I'm on timesheets, or I'm on short haul, or I'm only within 100 miles. Um, and I hear that all the time. Keep in mind that the hours of service, this is the regulation. All of those other things, the 100-mile radius and and the driver salesperson and any exceptions, they're exceptions to this rule. And the ELD mandate did not change the actual hours of service rules. They didn't change the rules. They just changed the way you record them now. So that's, that's what happened whenever they did the ELD mandate. The rules actually didn't change. Just the way you record them actually changed. So the rule has always been logbooks. If, if you think about it plain and simple, they've always been logbooks. So as we go through this, I still think it's important, even though uh, your drivers might be on ELD systems, they can't rely on the ELD systems to do everything for them. And, and I'll say it doesn't do everything for them. They still have to be able to fill out a paper log if that logbook fails. So I, I feel like hours of service training is still very important because they need to understand whenever that countdown clock is going on their ELD system, why and what it means. and and all that stuff. Don't rely on technology to do everything for you. Whenever I'm speaking to drivers, I'm, I'm speaking to you that way. And also on the back office side, um, this is the rule. It's going to remain the rule. Um, so how it's recorded. So it's off duty, sleeper berth driving and on not on duty, not driving. So if you look at the, the grid itself and ELDs also have this grid, they're required to keep this grid. That part didn't change either. The ELD mandate actually says that the grid still has to be there. So all ELD systems, if they're compliant, they have the same grid. So it's gonna be off duty. So if we're looking at this right here is off duty, then you have the sleeper berth and driving, then on duty, not driving. Um, and then you write your remarks down here. So like I said, off duty, sleeper berth, driving, on duty, not driving. There is one other type of log, which I have a separate class just for that, which is oil and gas exemptions. Um, and they have a fifth line while site waiting time. So if you are in the oil and gas industry, then I highly recommend you watch that particular class once you've watched this one, because they kind of go together, just like if I have one for short haul exemptions. Um, so if you maybe possibly do qualify for their short haul exemptions, don't think that you shouldn't do this one first. I would always say do this one first and then see if you qualify and if you do qualify, then watch those other classes if that's something like oil and the gas, if you qualify for those exemptions, then watch that one. If you're short haul, watch that one. But I really highly recommend that as you're doing and thinking about the oil uh, or the hours of service, other than the oil and gas, if you sometimes you're short haul, sometimes you're not, watching both is, is kind of important. So, all right, 
First off, we're going to talk about the 30 minute break. So the current 11 hour rule um, driving rule will remain in place. The 30 minute break is something that if you're an interstate driver and sometimes intrastate, it depends on the state. So like if you're operating, if you're intrastate in Texas, Texas did not adopt the 30 minute break rule. So in Texas, if you stay intrastate, truly intrastate, you don't have to do the 30 minute breaks. There's also some other industries that don't have to do 30 minute breaks. So if you're hauling live animals, whether that be, you know, crab or cows or pigs or whatever, um, you actually don't have to do the 30 minute break either. And there are some other industries that have that same exception. I think um, drive away, tow away has that. I'm pretty sure they do as well as um, like cement trucks. Uh, if you are ready mix driver, you don't have to do the 30 minute break either because time sensitivity does matter. You, know, you don't want to destroy your whole load of ready mix because of this whole 30 minute break issue. So, um, so those are industries that have those exemptions. They don't have to do the 30 minute breaks for anybody else. If you're operating interstate, you do have to do the 30 minute breaks. Now there is talk of them adjusting the hours of service rules. Anytime I see they have proposed rules right now, it's always like a two year process. At the very least, I see a two year process. They have the proposed rule. They wait for the comments right now. They're, I think they either just finished the comment period or they're still in that comment period process and they're kind of analyzing the hours of service rules and if they want to change those or not. So until that happens, we're just going to say the 30 minute rule now applies and it does apply right now. So, so here's what I said about examples. I really just want to walk through these examples with you because I think that's for me, that was always the easiest way to learn is by doing. So we're going to walk through each one of these logs as an example. So with a 30 minute break, the 30 minute break is you have to take a 30 minute break within the first eight hours of coming on duty. It's not, it has nothing to do with driving. It's about coming on duty. So that means if you actually work a 16 hour day on duty, if you work a 16 hour day and you take your 30 minute break, the first two hours, you're going to have to take two breaks, two 30 minute breaks because every eight hour period, it must be done. So my suggestion is to, if you can, just to make things simpler, try to take the 30 minute break between the sixth and the eighth hour. That way you only have to take one, but just for, you know, example purposes, we're going to do these slides and then we're going to go from there. So with this, we're just doing the 30 minute break. You're ignoring all of the other rules. Cause I like to do them individual and kind of a la carte. If you, if you'd say, so whenever it's, um, so think of the regulations kind of like an a la carte menu. Each rule is individual and by itself. And then we're going to combine them all together at the very end so we can look at a whole logbook and kind of assess all those different violations. So let's just start with a 30 minute break. So here's a 30 minute break. The driver starts, he's on duty uh, or off duty until 7 a.m. So now we're at 7 a.m. And we're going to assume everything before this, everything before on any of these slides has, has been off duty because I'll almost always start it off duty or I'll tell you different. So starts at 7 a.m., goes on duty, does a pre-trip inspection. We're going to assume that's a pre-trip inspection. Good for him. It was 30 minutes. Um, goes right to driving, drives that period of time, goes up, goes off duty for that 30 minute period, back on duty, not driving, and now continues to drive again and then goes back on duty, not driving, hopefully doing a post-trip inspection, and then goes off duty for that two hours. Would this be a violation? Now we see that the 30 minute was taken at 7 a.m. he started, and all you gotta do is eight hours later. So seven, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Was that 30 minute break in, taken within that eight hours? And it was. So there should not be a violation. And if you look over here, we're adding up the total hours. So nine and a half hours, zero hours, um, 12 and a half hours driving. That ought to tell you something right there. But we're only doing the 30 minute break and then two hours on duty, not driving. So would this be a violation of the 30 minute break rule? It wouldn't be a violation because you took that 30 minute break within the first eight hours or within eight hour period. So let's go to another one. Um, pretty simple, right? 30 minute break is very simple. As long as you take it within the first eight hours of coming on duty, not driving, coming on duty. So off duty until 7 a.m., goes on duty, drives for a long period of time, goes off duty. We're gonna assume that this is the 30 minute break. Even though it is technically not required, I highly recommend that they do that drop down and then write the comments and actually say that this is the break. 
because if they take a break here or 30 minutes off here, 30 minutes off here, 30 minutes off here, the officers sometimes can just use whichever one they feel like using and say, well, you didn't take this one. I mean, they shouldn't do that. Um, and I just say, clarify which one you're taking as technically your 30 minute break, even though technically you don't have to. And as long as you took 30 minutes within the eight hours, technically they can't do anything. But I've seen officers kind of mess with this just a little bit. So would this be a violation? 7 a.m., all we're going to do is count eight, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight hours. The 30 minute break was taken after three o'clock, which would have been the eight hour mark. So would it be a violation? Yes, it'd be a violation because it was after eight hours of coming on duty. You started at 7 a.m., so within eight hours. And like I said, if you took it between sixth and the eighth hour, the sixth and the eighth hour, then you would only have to take two for this really long day. Let's do the 11 hour rule. So the 11 hour rule says that a driver can only drive. Now this is for general purposes. I do realize that passenger carriers, you have different hours of service rules, but the same kind of rule set applies. You're just gonna change it from 11 hours to 12 hours. Um, so if you're intrastate, same thing. Texas, you have the eight, um, 12, 15, and 70, instead of the 10, 11, 14 and 70. So like I said, you can still kind of use the same formula, just change the, the different time limit. Okay, so we're gonna be on duty. We're gonna assume that at midnight, they were off duty and everything before was good, but we're just calculating actual driving time. What this rule says for general purposes, a driver may not drive more than 11 hours in one given shift or in between each 10 hour rest period. So at midnight we're going to say this is midnight and driver starts driving the easiest way to do this is just count the boxes and it's interesting because anytime i go to uh or used to now most everything's elds now but whenever i would go to a client's office and i would see all the little dot marks on the the log pages that told me that they were actually looking at it and it's interesting whenever i talk to investigators they notice the same thing they notice the dot marks and it says well it just tells them that they actually are looking at them when there's no dot marks or there's nothing kind of they can't really prove that you're not looking at them but those little dot marks always kind of make it seem you know that you're actually paying attention and looking to see what what's going on with your drivers and you're regularly auditing those logs so let's just count the easiest way to do this is count the line for the driving so and it doesn't matter what all is going up and down none of that matters so we're going to say this is you know three quarters of an hour so one two three and then we have this one and this one make four five six seven eight nine and then we have ten would this be a violation 10 hours of actual driving time so we're just going to look at it you can always just go actually it's 11 hours you can always just go by what the driver says too but keep in mind drivers actually add stuff up wrong so i always look to see if it's close to the they drove 11 hours so i always look to see to make sure did they add it up right so no it wouldn't be a violation because it was within the 11 hours they have 11 hours of driving time that they can drive so let's look at this one. Driver is off duty um, till 7 a.m., goes on duty, not driving, goes up to driving, takes 30 minute breaks, goes to driving again. Would this be a violation? So we're gonna look and we're gonna say nine and a half hours off duty, zero hours sleeper birth, 12 and a half hours of driving, and two hours of on duty, not driving. So for general purposes, yes, this would be a violation. And the violation actually starts at 7.30 p.m. because at that point at 7.30 is when the 11th hour occurred. It doesn't mean the driver can't be working. It just means the driver can't drive a commercial motor vehicle anymore. It means that they have to cease operations of a commercial motor vehicle. Now, like I said, if you're intrastate, if you're you know, in a passenger carrier, your hours are different, but you'd still, you'd still be at 12 and a half, right? So you'd still be in violation. Technically, you would be in violation. So there is an exception the 16 hour exception i do not like telling drivers about this and i will tell you about that a little bit later as we go could you potentially use this and use the 16 hour exception possibly so we're going to talk about that a little later so let's talk about the 14 hour rule now so here is the 14 hour rule so the 14 hour is 
we're starting at midnight till 8 a.m. We're off duty. Off duty. Every time before that, we're off duty. So we're starting kind of with a clean slate. On duty, not driving for two hours. So at 8 a.m. for two hours until 10 and then drive for four hours. Go up here, go off duty for four hours, go back down on duty for three hours, and then go to driving for three hours. Would this be a rule, a rule violation for the 14 hour rule? So the easiest way I think to look at this, this is this is how I feel like it's very simple to just look. All you need to do, and the simplest way I have found, is at 8 a.m., you know they started working. It's not about driving time, it's not about when they started driving, it's about when did they come on duty. They started coming, they came on duty at 8 a.m., so that's their start time, that starts the clock. Now this has nothing to do with oil and gas exemptions on the well site waiting time, this has nothing to do with anything other than the 14 hour rule for general purposes. So at 8 a.m., they started their clock, that starts the 14 hour clock right there. All you have to do, we know 12 hours, is 8 p.m. so just add another two hours to it so even if you're on Texas time or your passenger and it's 15 hours just instead of 14 it's 15 um, so at 8 p.m. that means it's 12 hours add two hours now it's 10 o'clock really the easiest way to do it forget all this mess in here because unless this was a full 10 hours all of this doesn't mean anything you just look at the start time look at the end time were they driving after 10 o'clock yes they were driving after 10 o'clock so it's probably going to be a violation if that's the case, then at that point, then you would look at here and you would see, was this a full 10 hour reset? And if it wasn't, then you're in violation. So I find a lot of people focusing and looking at all of this stuff in between when it, it doesn't matter. This basically didn't count. That four hours that, that the driver spent off duty does not count for anything. It actually hurt him more than it helped him. It didn't help him at all, other than the fact that maybe he was tired, so he did the right thing by stopping and sleeping for four hours. Maybe it messed up his hours, who cares? I would prefer a driver to stop whenever they're tired, regardless of what the hours of service say, even if they have more time left. If you're tired, you're tired, stop driving the truck. Um, but for this purpose, we're just gonna say the driver just decided to take off for four hours in between a shift, and now it just messed up the rest of his day because he didn't plan ahead. So, that's the easiest way to look at it. Started at 10 p.m. We know at 10 p.m. that's the 14th hour and he continued to drive. So a lot of companies think that it's about on-duty time here. With the 14-hour rule, it has nothing to do with on-duty time. It has everything to do with what did the driver operate a commercial motor vehicle after the 14th hour of being on duty. It doesn't have to do with the driver can only work 14 hours a day. They can work 22 hours, 22 and a half, 23 and a half hours a day. The DOT does not care how many hours they work a day. What they care about is when they get back in a truck. That's what they care about. They can work 23 hours a day. They just can't get in a commercial motor vehicle once they've been on duty for the 14th hour. Once they've been on for 14 hours, they can't drive a commercial motor vehicle. Can they drive their personal vehicle? Can they drive something else that's not a commercial motor vehicle? Yes, they can. You're putting yourself at risk if you're having them drive a company truck that's not considered a commercial motor vehicle with the risk of allowing somebody that's fatigued to be in your company truck. That's a big problem and a lot of companies are doing it. Um, so this is just saying after the 14th hour, the driver cannot drive or operate a commercial motor vehicle once he's been on duty for 14 without taking that 10 hour reset in between. So here's another one. So off duty until 7 a.m. goes on duty, pre-trip inspection, goes to driving. So I wanna say the pre-trip inspection is required to be logged on their logbook or ELD system. It is required to be there. The pre-trip inspection is a required function that the driver does and they are on duty, not driving while they're doing that inspection. If you see anything less than 15 minutes on a pre-trip or a post-trip inspection, they didn't do it. They just didn't do it. You can't do a valid pre or post-trip inspection because part of that pre and post-trip inspection is that you open the hood and check all the fluids. Not to mention walk around the whole truck, look under the truck, check the brakes, check the measurements, check the tires, check all the lights, left blinker, right blinker, headlights, tail lights, all that stuff, make sure all that works. Um, if somebody can get that done in less than 15 minutes, which I'm sure there probably are some that can, as well as pulling the hood, testing all the fluid, or checking all the fluids and doing all that stuff, 
Um, just, I would say best practice minimum 15 minutes. So if they're not doing it in, less, <clears throat> in at least 15 minutes, then an officer can say you didn't do a proper pre-trip inspection or you didn't do one at all, um, or you're gonna have falsification of logs. Most cases, they're gonna go with falsification of logs. And I would too, because they can't say they did something when they didn't. So I just wanna clarify, a pre-trip inspection is always required to be here and always required to be um, on here post-trip as well. A lot of companies are saying, well, do your pre-trip inspection as off-duty. It's not off duty, they're actually on duty, not driving at that point. So back to it, 7 a.m. on duty, not driving, they go right to driving at 7.30, they drive for this many hours, take their 30 minute break, drive some more, and then go back, um, now they get back to the location and they are sitting there and they're waiting to be unloaded and they're waiting for three hours. Would this be a violation? So let's just go right to the calculation here, seven and a half hours off duty, zero hours in a sleeper berth, 13 hours of driving. We already know that's a violation, but we're only looking at the 14 for right this minute. And then they have three and a half hours on duty, not driving. Like I said, easiest way to do this, 7 a.m., go right to 7 p.m., that's 12 hours, add two, here's 9 p.m., would this be a violation? No, it's not a violation, because at the 14th hour, the driver stopped driving. It doesn't matter that the driver continued working. It matters, did they stop driving? And for this particular page, the driver would not be in violation. You, of course, they are in violation of the driving time, but maybe they use a 16 hour exception for that minute. Um, but it doesn't matter. We're only looking at the 14 hour for right now. Whenever we're gonna do a full log page, then I'll show you kind of the differences on that particular page. But this one isn't in violation. And it's because the driver did not continue driving. They continued working, but not driving. So let's do another 14 hour rule. So this one, the driver is driving. We're gonna assume that started driving exactly at midnight. So driving for three hours, goes into sleeper berth for a couple hours, driving for two hours, goes off duty for one, two, three, four, five, six, seven hours, goes to driving, on duty not driving, and now driving again. So would this be a violation? Best case scenario, he has maybe two violations, right? Anytime you see this up and down, up and down, all the way across the page, you can almost always find a violation in it. But what I get concerned about is when they have a really long off-duty period here. But if you notice, if you add it up, because you can't split the sleep, sleeper berth between eight hours and two. So you can have eight and two now, but that's it. You can't do six and four, you can't do seven and three. It has to be a full minimum of eight hours in the sleeper berth and two hours off duty um, before or after or basically within that 14 hours. It has to be consecutive. So the 10 hours, the off duty period for one, the sleeper berth wasn't connected to this right here. So there was time in between, so it doesn't count anyway. But right here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven hours, it wasn't a full eight hours, so it doesn't count. So they basically just wasted all of this time in the sleeper berth for nothing. Because now, let's add it up. Seven hours off duty, two hours in the sleeper berth, 10 hours driving, five hours, and now we hit 24. Absolutely, it's gonna be a violation, and here's why. The first one, 14 hour rule, now we're just looking at 14 hour rule violations, by the way. The first 14 hour rule violation is at two o'clock. Started at midnight, we know at noon, that's 12, add two. Now it's two o'clock, that's 14 hours. And now there's driving time. If this would have been a 10 hour reset between this and this, then this would be perfectly okay. It would have basically restarted his day. But because they're not consecutive and because that is not a full eight hours all by itself off duty, it doesn't count. Or at least eight hours in the sleeper berth. It could be sleeper berth, which is considered off duty, or it could be actually on the line off duty. But it's in violation. So it started at two, but then again, the same 14 hour rule violation started again at 10. And why is that? So it's because they drove, they went on duty not driving, and then they did it again. So here is two separate 14 hour rule violations on the same log page. Believe me, I've seen 
multiple violations, same rule, different rules, all on one log page, and it ended up costing the carrier a ton of money. So two violations for the 14 hour rule on the same day, all because they didn't take the full reset like they were supposed to. So let's do a full logbook, like the whole logbook. We're looking at the whole thing. We're not looking at the 60 or 70 hour rule just yet, but we are just looking at the for the day. So we're expecting to see that 10 hour reset um, in between shifts. So driving time, we're gonna assume at midnight, they started at midnight, everything before that is good and they were off duty. Started at midnight, went off duty for an hour between the five and 6 a.m. Went in the sleeper berth for three hours, went off duty again for an hour. So we've got four, three, four, five hours off duty right here and then another three right here. So there's eight hours total off duty, right? And then you drop down and you go to driving. They're driving from one until six, and then they go off duty again, and then they go down driving, and now they're off duty again for two hours here. So would this be a violation? We've got five hours of off duty. We've got six hours of sleeper berth. We've got 13 hours of driving. And we've got zero hours on duty not driving. So right off the bat, we know 13 hours are in violation of that at least, right? What about all this other stuff? So yes, they're in violation. Like I said, anytime you see the up and down, up and down all the way across, it's most likely a violation. First off, let's talk about the pre-trip inspection. They didn't log their pre-trip inspection. So either they're gonna get a violation for not doing their pre-trip inspection, or they're gonna get a violation for falsifying their logs, one or the other, which honestly, no pre-trip inspection is better than falsifying. Not that either one of them is good. So no PTI, 12 a.m. At 2 p.m., here's the 14 hour rule, is violated because at 14th hour, they continue to drive. They're still driving after the 14th hour. At 7 p.m., the 14 hour rule again because they changed duty status and then continued to drive. Even though they stopped, changed duty status, they drove again after changing the duty status. That's another violation of the 14 hour rule. At 8 p.m., here's the 11 hour rule because at 11 hours of driving, they can't drive anymore. And again, at 10 p.m. for another PTI, they did not come down and put on duty not driving to mark their PTI. And we're assuming that they ended their trip. So, so five violations, one, two, three, four, five. If each one of those violations costs you roughly about $500, and there's five of them, that's gonna cost you during a compliance review at least 2,500 bucks if they choose to fine you for that particular violation, which I would say with hours of service, almost all violations in hours of service are either acute or critical violations, almost all of them. I think the only one that's not is general form and manner. So there might be a couple others that I'm missing, but for the most part, most all of them during a compliance review, this can put you in an unsatisfactory rating. Hours of service rules alone can put you in an unsatisfactory rate or a conditional rating. And with combined with in other factors, then at that point you can be in a full conditional or full unsatisfactory rating for your whole company. Because they do these, these audits, if you watch the, the uh, six audit factors uh, session, then you understand they do all these in factors. So factor one, factor two, factor three. Being aware, not to mention how much the fines are, because the fines, like I said, minimum 500 bucks probably. You're gonna have five different ones on long, one log page. Drivers have 180 log pages, six months worth of logs. Typically they audit 30 days at a time. So 30 days for each particular driver that they're auditing or investigating. That's a lot of money that you potentially are gonna spend on fines for that. And that's the minimum. Let me say $500 is the minimum amount. So I've seen fines be $8,000 for, for one thing. $10,000 because somebody missed a signature on one document. Hours of service is no joke and they take it very seriously whenever they're doing the auditing. So here's let's do another full exercise. Now we're looking at the 11 hour rule, PTIs, 14 hour rule, uh, 30 minute breaks, things like that. So driver is off duty till 5 a.m. Now we're at 5 a.m., drop down, do the PTI, goes to driving, on duty, not driving. So you just add up these hours, but we're going to do it for you. And then sleeper berth for all this time right here. So let's just add up these hours, five hours off duty, nine hours in the sleeper berth, three and a half hours driving. 
and six and a half hours, which totals, of course, 24 hours. I want to be clear here, this will always equal 24. At no point in time will this ever equal 96, 48, anything other than 24. There is only 24 hours in a day. And I've seen several times, several drivers actually just add up, I don't know, however many days. I don't know what they were thinking, but it didn't add up to 24. This will only ever equal 24 because there's only ever 24 hours on this grid. Each grid, it doesn't matter. It goes by time. It doesn't matter what the date is. It's about the time. So if you started at 1 a.m. on November 15th, it only goes to the end of November 15th. I mean, it only go. actually it does not. It goes to November 16th. So now we have November 15th here, and it goes all the way until at midnight it changes to November 16th. So this is just one day. There's only 24 hours in a day, and the day, the date always starts at midnight, and it always ends at midnight. It's just the way it is. So tell your drivers this never changes. I know that seems silly to explain, but believe me, it happens. So with this said, we looked at all this stuff, gave you enough time to add those lines, that it is in violation, and here's why. The 30-minute break violation. So right here at 5, you just count 8 hours later, so 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 at 1 o'clock, that's the eight hour mark, so where's the 30 minute break? They have to go up to off duty, off duty for 30 minutes, and that's their break time, but they didn't take a break. So right off the bat at one, 30 minute break violation. At 11.30 p.m., here's a 14 hour rule. So all this time right here did not count. And it's funny, because if they would have just stayed on duty not driving, instead of getting back in the truck that last 30 minutes, they would have been fine. Or if they would have just, and I don't mean fine because it rolls over to the next day, I don't mean fine like they could have continued to drive, but at that point on this page, this one's in violation, and now the investigator knows that probably the next one is too. And it's going to continue to be in violation until they take this full 10 hours off. They only spent nine hours in the sleeper berth. They had no off-duty time before and after. This is a violation. Yes, they got plenty of rest, but the DOT says it has to be a full 10 hours. This is what they're trying to change right now. They're, or they're talking about it. They proposed new, um, they haven't proposed actual rules. <clears throat> Actually, they're still working on the comment period to study whether they want to consider changing the rules um, because they haven't specified what they want to change them to. They're just talking about they potentially might. So because this wasn't a full 10 hours, even though it's only an hour off, and even though most of us can get a good night's sleep in nine hours, the DOT doesn't care. They say that has to be a full 10 hours consecutive, no breaks in between, nothing going on in between, off duty or in the sleeper berth. Otherwise, it doesn't count. Might as well not have happened. He might as well have been on duty working this whole time. Now, because he drove that 30 minutes right here, now he's in violation of the 14-hour rule. Big deal. Okay, so like this one. Midnight, and we know this one's a fine because the potential fine right here is anywhere from six to sixty-six thousand dollars. Very rarely will they ever go to sixty-six thousand dollars on one log page, but if they wanted to, they could. So there is formulas that they have to use and caps that there is that there are applied. So driving, we're going to drive, start driving at midnight, drive for five hours, go off duty for an hour. Now they're in the sleeper berth for one, two, three, four, five, six, seven hours. Then driving back in the sleeper and then back over. So let's just look at this over here. One and a half hours, half hours off duty. Now, if you think this is a whole 24 hour period. So in 24 hours, they have one and a half hours off duty. Sleeper birth technically is really considered <clears throat> um, off duty. I mean, they're in the sleeper birth, so that is sufficient if they're actually in the sleeper birth to use sleeper birth time. Um, so they have 10 hours in the sleeper birth, but because they weren't consecutive, doesn't mean anything. This sleeper birth split with this one, it does not matter, because especially this is after the 14th hour anyway, but they have to be consecutive. Consecutive 10 hours. And now we got 13 hours of driving, so we know, obviously, past 11 hours. And zero hours of on-duty not driving, so what does that tell you? Probably no PTIs. Not to mention, they didn't add it up right. So, violation, obviously, yep, 
two of them right here at 12 and then again at 11.30 for no pre-trip inspection, no post-trip inspection. The second one at 3 p.m., the 14-hour rule, violated driving after the 14th hour. 7 p.m., the 11-hour rule, because at 7 p.m., they've been driving, whether it was split up or not, it doesn't matter, now for 11 hours. At 10 p.m., the 14-hour rule again, and the 11-hour rule again, because they changed duty status, and now went back right to driving, right here. So at 10 p.m., they were in a sleeper berth, and then they changed duty status and started driving again. Those two violations wouldn't be there if they were on duty, not driving. But because they started driving again, a commercial motor vehicle, now they're in violation. With that being said, thank you so much for taking time out of your day. I know you're crazy busy. So if you're interested in, interested in taking all of your stuff digital, then go to dot-ready.com. Check that out. It's a platform that we actually designed to be totally 100% compliant with DOT regulation um, for the areas that, that the platform covers. So check that out. You can schedule a demo, all that stuff right there. So anyway, have a great day. Thanks.